Tim, what do you think about doing something Mediterranean this year? Mediterranean, I like that, Mediterranean. You know, Mediterranean is healthy, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of flavors in that cuisine. Yeah, a lot of different flavors, natural flavors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mediterranean, okay. Oh, welcome to Memorial Cooking Innovations. I'm Tim Scallon, registered dietitian. And I'm Michael Hodgkin, executive chef for Sodexo. Mike and I are planning episodes for this year on Memorial Cooking Innovations, and Mike, can you believe that we've completed another year of Memorial Cooking Innovations? I know it, and you've added one thing new this year. What? Me. That's right. We yeah. finally got you out from behind the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, you were there all along helping us develop recipes, yeah. but now you're teaching our viewers directly. I love it. Yeah. Well, okay, so, uh, and you know, also, I learned something about you this year. You have a sneaky side getting that pepperoni in on that pizza behind my back. Yeah, sometimes making a better flavor gets the best of me and I'll sneak things by when I can. Yeah. <laughs> getting those genes flowing. You know, one thing I found is music helps. When yes, it does. Hits your you hear that? Like a very big pizza okay, pie. all right. That's and very cool. Italian. Yes. yes. Well, and another thing that can help when you're having fun in the kitchen, which is pizza is a fun thing, yeah. uh, you know, having a glass of Chianti is... It always brightens the day. It does, that's right. It makes pizza making a lot more fun. Okay, so we've got those jeans started. Now let's just kind of put ourselves into uh, Italy and thinking about what what all we get from Italy. So, so for example, all the things that come to us from Italy. Leonardo da Vinci. Mm, spaghetti pomodoro. Uh, Michelangelo. Fettuccine Alfredo. Saint Francis of Assisi. Uh, Sophia Loren. Mm, now that's Italian. That's Italian. Yeah. And then the last step on this is what we want to do is we want to oil this crust with yeah. for the same reason we did uh, when we oiled it to right. uh, to proof. I know it gives it a little extra flavor. It too. does. That it olive adds, oil is so good. Adds a wonderful flavor, and of course, you know the extra virgin olive oil. That flavor was made for pizza. Mm -hmm. Okay, last step. Seasonings. Yeah, and and actually, what I'm going to put on this mic is, I'm going to season it with. Uh, a little bit of fresh oregano. Got mm -hmm. got this. Uh, this isn't oregano. Got this oregano out of uh, my herb garden this morning. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I took a piece of this. And incidentally, when you're uh, when you're picking your herbs, like if you buy that little plastic thing of herbs at Brookshire Brothers, for example, and you, you're going to pay five dollars for that, take it out of that, water it, and then put it in something like this. Put a little water in the mm -hmm. thing. And you know, this will stay in the fridge for a week or two. Right. So what I did is I just uh, diced some of that fresh oregano. And I'm going to season this. And then also, spread this around a little bit. Got fresh thyme here that I'm just mm -hmm. going to pull these leaves off. They pull better if you pull them backwards towards right. the stem. So you don't, that's not something you have to cut. And, and this just adds a good fresh flavor. You could mm -hmm. if you had some fresh basil. I, I just got to say, I'm surprised you didn't have fresh basil. Well, I, I use it sometimes. Yeah. I, just, uh, I, I just didn't put it on, on this pizza. But, of course, you know, anything tomato, basil goes good. You're right. Okay, and so that's got our crust seasoned. Now we're going to set this aside and let it rise for a little bit. Okay, so what do you think? I think it's beautiful. All right, well, Mike, I think we are ready to put that thing in the oven, and then we're going to eat some pizza. Very good. I'm waiting. Okay, Mike, how are we looking? Uh, oh, it's looking pretty good. 
Ooh, that smells delicious. What? What's that pepperoni doing on there? Yeah, I, I don't know. It must have been a pepperoni fairy around somewhere. It's a good thing we had one. <laughs> you know what? Mm -hmm. You're turning into one of my favorite chefs. You know that? I tell you, well, I'll make it taste good. It may not be the best for you, but I'll make it taste good. Well, I think we need to eat <laughs> this pizza. One of the best shows I really enjoyed was the Berry Show. You know, I got a lot of good feedback on that show. Mm -hmm. And it was a good opportunity to teach the concept of organic farming and farm to table. Right. Tell us a little bit about Good Roots Garden and how you got into uh, organic gardening. Okay. Well, Larry and I lived in Austin for many years and we started organic gardening in our backyard. Mm, and right. we had an opportunity to come here to East Texas where Larry grew up and he has, his family has owned this land for many, many generations. Oh, and so, that is so cool. Yeah, it is cool that he got to come back to where he grew up. And we decided we were just going to do something with the land. And we were really interested in growing organically. Yeah. So we just started our farm and we've been sort of teaching ourselves uh, all of the, you know, how to farm for the last five years. Larry, tell us about some of the challenges to organic farming. Well, there are lots of challenges. Um, pests are a problem because you, we can't use pesticides. That's yes. one example. So um, to work with that, in general, you try to get your soil as healthy as possible beforehand. Okay. Okay. That's, the, that's the best way. Is you, and that can take a number of years, basically adding more orga organic matter to the soil yes. and doing things that help encourage the uh, beneficial microorganisms that help the plant. Feed the plant. Yeah, right. Which makes them more healthy. Right. Just like with people with your stomach, you know, your digestive system, you have beneficial microorganisms. Yes. Plants have that too. And some things about conventional farming do harm those beneficial microorganisms. You know, uh, there's a major field of study right now on gut microflora. And the, the, the study is all about how do we feed the beneficial bacteria. And of course, so that's where we're getting pre and probiotics. Mm -hmm. So your analogy is, is just fascinating to me that the same thing is true for plants. We're healthier if we keep a, a healthy gut biome. Right. And these plants are healthier and can fight off uh, pests better if we keep the soil healthy. It's true, it's true. Um, Pests attack weak plants, just yes. like uh, coyotes attack weak animals. Yes. I mean, you and people are going to fight off disease better when they're healthier. It's, it's the same thing. You just applied to the soil. Jerry, here we are, two dietitians in the berry kitchen, and there are no chefs here to tell us what to do. <laughs> we can do whatever we want. We could make a video, Dietitians Gone Wild. Woohoo! Let's do it. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, but seriously. Now, when we started talking about this show, we don't have to get too serious, do we? <laughs> so when we started talking about this show, uh, we were talking about what recipes do we want to do, and I suggested, well, you know, let's do something f with produce from your farm. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised at your choice. You, you chose French sorrel. And I had to go look up French sorrel. I didn't even know what sorrel I was. I stumped the dietitian. You yeah. did. You did. So tell me, how, why did you choose sorrel? Sorrel. Well, it is an unusual thing. You, you don't mm -hmm. really see it at the grocery store very often. Yeah. And I chose it because, well, one for flavor, because it has a real lemony flavor. It yes. tastes really good mixed yes. in salad. Um, and, and, and you showed me that as we were picking it. It was, it was really delicious. It is delicious. And it's also in season right now. So you want to choose foods as much as you can that are in season because they're mm -hmm. at their peak of nutrition. And if they're at their peak of nutrition, they're also at their peak of flavor. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so okay. this is in season and then it's real high in vitamin C. Oh, okay. 
And it's just different. It just I thought mm -hmm. it would be fun and just kind of encourage people to try something in their home garden. Makes a good green. Right. All right. Okay. Well, you want to make the salad dressing yeah, first. Yeah. Let's make the salad dressing. Okay. So so what do you start? Okay. With? So we're going to use some balsamic vinegar. Okay. Do one tablespoon. All right. Well, one of the things that I learned from Memorial Cooking Innovations is that making your own salad dressing is the easiest thing in the world. In fact. You know, once I started making salad dressing at home, uh, the difference in the flavor, uh, I just stopped buying ready-made salad dressing, and you will too, once you see the difference in the flavor. And one of the things that, uh, when we were talking about this earlier, that you pointed out, which I, I thought was uh, a good dietitian thing to point out, is that not only are fresh-made dressings uh, more flavorful, but they're lower in sodium and sugar. Right, and there's no um, food additives. Food additives or yeah. preservatives in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what are you adding right now? This is just water. Water, okay. Filtered water. Okay. I put in some honey. Okay. And then a dash of salt and pepper. Okay. We'll do that next. So, a basic vinaigrette is, and this you could say a basic salad dressing has these ingredients. It has oil, and of course we always want to use a good extra virgin olive oil right. because of the flavor. Uh, some acid, in this case it's the vinegar. You could use a different acid. You could use, for example, uh, lemon juice would mm -hmm. be an acid you could use in a salad. Uh, Salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. Okay, did I leave anything out? Basically, mm -hmm. well, water, water. Right. Okay, so these are the basic yeah. ingredients in, in a salad dressing. Now, you can vary uh, what kind of vinegar, balsamic, red wine. Uh, you could vary uh, uh, different flavoring. So mm -hmm. in this one, you're, what are you flavoring this vinaigrette with? Um, blackberries, the wild blackberries yes, that okay. we picked outside. Blackberry vinaigrette. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and I'm then, ready to blend it. Okay, all right. Farm to Table refers to a current movement concerned with producing food locally and delivering that food to local consumers. It is also associated with organic farming initiatives, sustainable agriculture, and community-supported agriculture. The Farm to Table movement has arisen concurrently with recent changes in attitude about food freshness, eating seasonally, small farm economics, and food safety. Advocates of the Farm to Table model believe that the freshest foods come from nearby farms rather than shipped from distant locations. Food freshness directly impacts flavor and nutrition content. And we've seen this on Memorial Cooking Innovations. You know, you hear us say the fl flavor is in the freshness. Buying food locally supports local farmers and the local economy. There's a growing public backlash against genetically modified foods, or some people refer to these as GMOs, and many people are questioning the long-term safety of this part of our food production system. This story will continue to develop as more research either confirms or disputes the safety of GMO foods. But for now, look for organic foods at your local farmer's market, and you can find a wide selection of organic foods at your local Brookshire Brothers grocery store. Well, one of the things I like about Memorial Cooking Innovations is it's a great place to learn good cooking skills. Yeah, with good cooking skills, your preparations are a lot easier. Yeah. You know, that show you did on knife skills was mm. incredible. Yeah, proper knife handling will save you on a lot of band-aids. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, over my years is in the kitchen at being a chef, I've seen a lot of errors, a lot of good things, and tried to pick up a few things. And I'd like to show you today some of the things I've learned and hopefully save a few band-aids in your future. Uh, the first thing I like to do is, if someone is going out and starting out and wanting to buy good knives, uh, there's two or three good brands out there. Myself, I like German knives, but it's what feels good for you. You want to get one that when you pick it up, it fits your hand. It's, it's got to feel solid and feel good. Uh, you want to make sure when you grip a knife, you put your, this is called the heel of the knife, your thumb on one side, your forefinger on the other. Keep your other fingers out of the way. It, uh, that way you've got a solid, solid feel for the knife. Uh, if you're starting out buying knives, there's probably three that you should really start out with. This is a French knife. It's also called a chef's knife. It's also, I believe it's called a utility knife. 
Uh, be, and those names are all very well new, used because it would do everything. Uh, it will cut, dice, anything you want it to do. You can open cans with it, but if it's a good knife, you probably don't want to do that. But it is strong enough to do that. Uh, it is it's just an all-around purposeful knife. The second knife I would buy would be a slicer. Now, there's two kinds of slicers. One is a straight edge, like this. And this is best for, I would like, turkey, roast beef, uh, items like that. This is a serrated edge knife. Again, it's better for breads and tomatoes or anything with a tough skin that you want to cut through quickly without compressing the item you're cutting. But it can also be used for turkey and roast beef as long as you don't press too hard because you will shred it. But it will slice very nicely. If you had to get, if you only wanted one of the two, I'd prefer the serrated edge. The third knife is your paring knife. Uh, just because it's small doesn't mean it's not sharp. People probably get cut with these more than anything else because they're going to use these for fine cutting, uh, your gar manger work, uh, cutting pies, apples, little things like that. And that's where people mess up because they're cutting an apple, they're not paying attention. When you're carrying a knife, you always want to pay attention to what you're doing. Remember what this hand and this hand is doing, okay? Now, as you can see, I have assorted other knives here. This is called a boning knife. Uh, again, it's a useful knife. It'd probably be number four on my list uh, because this is where you can take and if you can um, imagine, I don't know how many people out there have ever carved a lake or a steamship round. You probably haven't. But if you think of a pork chop and you think of the bone that goes around the pork chop, the point of this knife can go right in and cut right around that bone. And it just, it'll follow the bone so it'll leave little to no meat left behind. Uh, again, this is for raw cooking. You can use it for cook, cook cooking. Uh, cooked meats, but it's really made for raw meats because it is so pointy. I already told you about the flat-sided slicer. Very good knife. This is a, another a size. These knives will come from 8 inch to 14 inch. Uh, this is a, is a 12 inch. I do not use this in the kitchen normally, mostly because it takes a lot of room. And if you've got someone working your house the other way, you've got to watch out for their fingers as well as your own because it's just so long. But for cutting watermelon, cutting uh, pizza, it is fantastic because you go down once. You got the whole thing. This will go across the whole watermelon. Put your fingers here, your hand here, crunch down on it. It's going to go through. Okay? This is my, my game, my play thing. This is the equalizer. So uh, what I'd like to show you first is one is the how to hold the knife. I showed you that. Now, this is called an oil stone. Uh, it's also called an oil carborundum stone. This one is way more expensive than what someone would want to use in a household because in this one, there's three stones to it, coarse, medium, and fine stones. Uh, you do not, in a normal kitchen, one stone is fine, and you'd probably buy the medium stone. When you use this, uh, this stone or any stone, what you want to do is imagine a nickel between the stone and the blade of the knife. That is the angle you want to keep. And you want to make sure when you bring this around, you don't have to do it really hard because if you do it really hard, you're going to end up making a little groove or a dent in your knife because the pressure is going to be strongest where you have your fingers. So you're going to make sure you start at the heel and, whoops, sorry, start at the heel and just drag it along all the way evenly with even pressure. Now that's going to put an edge on the stone, uh, I'm sorry, edge on the knife. But in doing that, you're still going to be, it's very rough. Uh, think of sanding wood. If anybody's worked with wood, you go start with a coarse sandpaper and work your way down to a very, very fine sandpaper. Well, with steel, it's a little bit hotter than that because it's hotter than that. So what you want to do is start with a stone. In this case, that's why we have the three stones. Start with the, the heaviest, ground, coarsest grain. Go to the fine grain and then finish it off with a steel. The steel would call true the knife. It would take out any uh, indentations, any coarseness, any snags. It may, I know what I'm looking for so I can see it, but normal people probably wouldn't understand it, but a few strokes with the steel after they use the stone, they would definitely know the difference. Again, you start at the top with the heel of the hand uh, of the knife at the top. You bring it down with about the distance of a nickel. You always want to keep that and just gently bring it down. Just like that. Do not go fast. It's cute that it goes fast, but 
it's not worth the band-aids. You just go like that, and if you do it three or four times, it's probably sufficient. Now, when you buy a knife, most cases, the more expensive the knife, the harder the steel. The harder the steel, the harder the sharpen. But this knife right here is probably 23 years old. I've had to sharpen it twice in that 23 years, and I use it just about every day at home. Now, the steel, that's sharpening it. Using the steel, I'll probably do it once a week, maybe once every two weeks, depends on how it feels. Because you get a two, if you just drop this on the floor, you're gonna mess up the blade. So you wanna, you know, true the steel when you can. Now, one, part, one way people do it, I find it awkward, but it's the safest way, is they go down. And as you can see, I'm not good with it, but I suppose if you practice that way, it's the safest. But I'm old, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to do it traditionally and act like I'm cutting my arm off. Okay, that takes care of the sharpening. Now I picked out a few vegetables here that are probably the most common and most dangerous to, you, to cut with, or to, to be cut with. Uh, we'll start with an onion. Now there's a whole bunch of different ways to uh, cut an onion or dice an onion. Uh, some people would like to, and I'll just start this here first, get it started. You want to cut both sides. And the reason I'm doing this is because the faster you can get your item to cut to a flat surface, the better off you are. Because if you keep it cutting on a round surface, it, it's, just not, it's just not smart. You can imagine, try to cut this like this versus like this. It, it's just not intelligent. Now, you're going to see some people on TV do the little knife thing through here and then cut down through to make diced onions. It looks real good on camera. But I've seen a lot of chefs, TV chefs, that when they start getting crunched for time, they're going to do it this way. Now you have to be very aware of what you're doing. Your knife should have to be sharp. And you just come down straight through it like this. Just carefully doing it, watching your knife, watching your fingers, and holding it together. Okay? And then you just do the same thing the other way. You have perfectly diced onions. And you can do them as small as you want, any way you want. Okay? That is the safest way. And believe me, the onion cut, when you cut an onion and cut you, and cut you with just a nick, the juice of the onion gets in that cut, it burns. It really, really burns. So you don't want to do it twice. This is something, too, that sounds very, very simple. Never wipe the blade this way. It will cut through the cloth to you very, if it's a good knife. This way, you can't get cut. There is no way you're going to get cut. Go away, down, and away from you like that. It's, it's the only way to wipe a knife off. Okay, now a tomato. We take and do it, uh, say you want to dice a tomato, okay? One, you just come down like this. Now, this one is a pretty sharp knife. If this wasn't so sharp, I'd use a serrated edge. But in my ca this case, I don't have to. Now, I'm going to show you a nice, easy way to dice up a tomato. Again, going fast is cute. It's not worth the Band-Aids. Pile it back up like that. Come down again. And if you have a nice knife and do nice, even strokes, the tomatoes stay together. Whoop, that one didn't stay together. It's stuck. I need to come back down again. But if you want to make a salsa or saute tomatoes for a tomato sauce, there you go. Just like that. No Band-Aids. Now, you don't want to waste this. Okay? So just take this and twist it around. Well, I won't take that off here. There we go. But you can twist it around. Again, this is when you get more used to your fingers, where they are. There's, that's all the wasted tomato right there. And again, you can throw that right in your diced tomatoes, in your guacamole or whatever, and there's no waste. Some of you may not realize that you can watch these and other past episodes of Memorial Cooking Innovations on the CHI St. Luke's Memorial website. Uh, or you can watch them on YouTube. Uh, now, if you go to the website, you can download our, all our past recipes, and you can read uh, current topics on nutrition and health. You know, speaking of recipes, uh, I got a lot of really good feedback on the chicken spaghetti recipe we created. You know, I did too. Okay, Tim, well, it's already the plate up now, okay. and I just want to show you a, a way that I serve it, 
it's not really a traditional way. Usually in the traditional way, they do it as a casserole, yeah. uh, smothered in cheese, of course. Yeah. But uh, what I would like to do is uh, serve it as you would a regular plate of spaghetti. Okay, so why do you, why do you want to serve chicken spaghetti this way? Well, uh, three reasons. Uh, one is the spaghetti will stay on date. I really okay. don't like mushy spaghetti, and when you cook it in a casserole, that usually just is, comes out cooks gummy. It to death. Very gummy. Yeah. And uh, the presentation, I appeal, okay. I think is just as good. Okay. And you didn't use very much cheese in this recipe. That's, that's the winner. That's that, the third that's reason. That's the winner. That's the major reason. We don't use as much cheese. So when we reduce the cheese in this recipe, we're reducing sodium, cholesterol, and saturated fat. Right. And now you're really showing how to make this dish. So, so this isn't just a chicken casserole anymore. No, it can, it's, it's really a very nice presentable dish that you could have at a fine dining pot, you know, fine dining, uh, you know, a nice dinner out, uh, I mean, at your home. Uh, it's more than just a casserole for the family. But it's still that it's delicious, healthy. that delicious comfort food that all of us here in East Texas love as chicken spaghetti. Well, Mike, I guess we better get on with planning these shows. Yeah. Can you believe that we have done seven years of memorial cooking innovations? Seven years is a lot of healthy cooking. And a lot of flavor, huh? Yes. If you missed any past episodes of Memorial Cooking Innovations, you can see those on CHI St. Luke's Memorial website or on YouTube. And you can get any of the past recipes that we've created at the same website. Mike, do you think we can change the world this year? Absolutely. One, One bite, bite at a time. time. Memorial Cooking Innovations is made possible through the generous efforts of Brookshire Brothers, a celebration of family and community, CHI St. Luke's Memorial, the Polk Education Center, Sodexo Food Service, and the City of Lufkin, KLTX Channel 15.